Very cool. Well, welcome, Kyle. Kyle McRae, thank you so much for being on my podcast, Reality Realty. And um, Kyle is, he and I know each other, um, you know, basically through uh, internet acquaintances, um, social media. Never actually met in person, but we're going to make that happen soon. Anyway, Kyle, could you just kind of introduce yourself? Kevin, thank you so much for having me on your podcast, first and foremost. I feel like um, it, it's a more common occurrence nowadays to meet people on the internet and, and then uh, can transition that conversation or relationship offline. Um, so I look forward to meeting you uh, someday in the near future as well. My name is Kyle with Elman Mortgage. For those that uh, don't know, your listeners, I've been in the mortgage business for about 10 years. I worked in the corporate world, uh, if you will, on the mortgage side. And then over the last several years have been in production, helping homeowners get into homes, um, leveraging uh, home loans specifically. So residential mortgages. God. Awesome. Hey, so... What about maybe like a little, can you maybe give us a brief overview of the current mortgage landscape in the Sacramento area and maybe what trends you're seeing that are affecting buyers and sure. homeowners? You know, what, where, where do we begin? There's so much to say and uh, with a unlimited amount of press that's surrounding both the mortgage and real estate industry today, maybe what I'll start with is the obvious, with affordability. Affordability has been um, hurt by... Uh, the recent changes happening in our industries over the last few years, both with home prices and mortgage rates, you know, and so that has been a challenge for a lot of buyers um, specifically, you know, over the past few years, but, you know, real estate and agent and, and real estate agents, realtors specifically, and, and lenders um, like ourselves have uh, needed to be creative in an effort to help clients that are looking to buy or sell. And, um, you know, yeah, there's, there's some, certainly some challenges out there, but we are still helping clients. People are still buying and selling, maybe not to the magnitude that we saw a few years ago when rates were at all time lows, but definitely it's still happening in today's marketplace. So how are we helping those families? That's what we're focused on. How are we helping to overcome these challenges? That's that's our our uh, our goal, and in, in being in this industry. And that with that goes uh, a lot of first time home buyers. Do you have any advice? Like, what are the top pieces of, of advice you have for um, today's first time home buyers in today's market? Are there any like common misconceptions they should be aware of? Sure, I think you know. Probably many of your attendees on your show have stated things like a common misconception is first time home buyers believe 20% is required, 20% down is required, and that's not necessarily the case. I think if I'm being honest, many first time home buyers, the younger generation specifically, is pretty well versed. Um, I, I think. And the reason for that, well, what I should say is well-versed in that they are well-researched and they're pretty um, resourceful, let's call it, when it comes to the internet and doing research. So I think that that might be a myth or a common misconception that was previously the case, but we don't come across too many would-be first-time homebuyers with that uh, misconception. What is a more common misconception for first-time homebuyers today is, you know, with prices and interest rates being as high as they are, relatively speaking, right? Um, if we keep some historical context in mind, we would know that interest rates are at about a 10-year average. But when you're comparing that to historical lows, all-time lows from a few years ago, it, it can be perceived to be high. But a more common misconception to, to go back on topic would be that we, we just can't afford to buy in today's market. And that may be the case, but our av uh, uh, what we like to advocate for anyone, not just first-time homebuyers, is putting a plan in place. Have a conversation with a mortgage professional. Here's a misconception. 
that by having a conversation with a mortgage professional, it obligates you to move forward or that it's somehow going to hurt your credit score uh, by completing an application. Those are misconceptions today. And so if we're um, having a conversation, maybe even taking a step um, of completing an application and, and possibly even a soft credit pool, which has no impact on a first-time homebuyer's credit, um, we can put a plan in place and we can talk to them about how to overcome uh, the affordability challenges more specific to them. And so that, that, those are misconceptions we see today and, and often uh, we're able to overcome those by that consultative approach that we take. So uh, the soft credit pool, um, that's another common misconception because a lot of what I've been hearing is that they think that, you know, or actually I've been told myself is that it, you know, it's hard pull only, but it sounds like you're able to at least, uh, you know, have that conversation without, you know, doing a hard pull. Yeah. I think that's one of the ways right? that lenders have, have um, gotten creative is in years past one, it was a way to obligate a client by uh, performing a hard credit pull, knowing that most people, uh, prospective borrowers didn't want their, their credit pulled a number of times, even though, um, the industry and the CFPB and the government, the governing bodies that oversee, um, the process have made it such that you can shop lenders. So I, I'd want to sort of debunk that myth, but also speak to specifically ways that lenders have gotten creative is despite your ability to shop lenders within a period of time and not have it negatively impact your credit, why not do a soft credit pull uh, to start anyways? Unless you're anticipating purchasing in the near term, right? A soft credit pull isn't a guarantee. It isn't with the same level of certainties that a hard credit pull would be, but it does offer you a some insight into what your credit would be, your credit score, your mid FICO score, and also what debts you have, which may impact your ability to qualify for a certain loan amount. And so um, we would, again, advocate working with your lender to perform some of these steps to have an idea of where you stand today um, versus using, um, I, I think, uh, some websites out there, not to be named, have gotten really creative about putting mortgage calculators out there. And from my experience, they're, they're pretty um, inaccurate. And also, too, you have to know how to use a mortgage calculator. And if it's your first time as a, uh, a buyer, I, it's okay to plug, you know, some numbers in, but I wouldn't expect that to be accurate. So, um, again, don't be afraid to have a conversation with a lender and also know that they've gotten creative and giving you an understanding of where you, where you sit to, today from a borrowing perspective without making a formal commitment like a hard credit pull would. That's so good to know. Plus they can come to you. You do that soft poll, and I mean, like I, I, I'm just trying to go through the mind of you know, a first time buyer, and like that pressure that you feel like is being put on you to like make that commitment. So that's like you know another check you don't have to worry about. Plus, like when they come to you, you're going to be able to tell them like if they're you know what debts and where they're about where they're at, and then if they're not where they need to be, like what it takes to get to, or like a plan, or if and exactly. then type of thing, or. Do you guys have scenarios? Yeah, that, that we Good. go through scenarios specifically uh, for that reason. Now, I wouldn't consider ourselves credit experts. There are those out there. But because we deal with credit every day, we can advise clients on, let's say, what debts to pay out first if that is a challenge or an obstacle keeping someone from either qualifying or qualifying for the type of home they're looking to purchase. Um, most don't quite understand um, that just as an example, paying down a debt may not have an impact. Um, paying off a debt has a impact. So how do you know what debts to pay off first? And then alternatively, how do you know what debts 
um, are going to give you the best results of paying off. And what I mean by that is you certainly don't want to pay off all your debts and then have no funds for your down payment or closing costs. So there's a trade-off. Um, and when we go through the application process and review credit, that's part of the advice your lender will give you. Uh, again, is one, no hard credit check to start. Um, two, they're going to identify the debts. And we're not talking like uh, treecreditreport.com and all these different credit sesame and and uh, credit karma. Yeah. Th those are different scores, uh, by the way. And not to say we don't use those as well as consumers, but they're not used in the mortgage world. So you're, even if you are tracking your credit score, it may not be the same score that the mortgage industry is tracking. Um, nonetheless, once we've reviewed your credit, we'll be able to tell you if it makes sense for you to pay off a debt or not. And that's part of the advice that we would give. Got it. Got it. Awesome. Hey, I don't, no, if you want to talk about it or not, but the, I keep hearing about this, you know, California dream for all, and it keeps coming back. Do you, do you want sure. to talk about that? Yeah, all? I think it's one okay. of the best opportunities for first time home buyers. I um, mean, in this particular instance with the, the, uh, program coming back, it was actually released last year and had some pretty wild success in terms of demand. And I believe the resources were utilized very quickly. This time around, there's been some changes to it, but that doesn't take away from the fact that this is one of the best down payment assistance programs I've ever seen. And the reason for that being um, the magnitude, the size of the assistance, whereas most down payment assistance programs help to bridge the smaller gap, the minimum down payment thresholds of three to 5%. Um, where they'll, they'll right. offer some assistance in, in a, in a portion of that, or maybe all of it, and then maybe some closing costs, um, assistance as well, but not in all instances, this particular program offers up to 20% down for down payment and closing costs, uh, assistance, which is, you know, four to five times the level of support. So it's. It's um, no wonder there's so much demand and intention on this particular program. I will say that there is a downside to, to every program, or I should say there's always sure. advantages and disadvantages in this particular instance. And we may not go into great depth on this, on this show, uh, but uh, shared equity mm -hmm. um, a, as, as mm -hmm. one potential downside. Um, and two, there are some stricter guidelines this time around with being first generational home buyers that so your parents cannot currently own. There's some stricter income um, limits there. So wow. definitely connect with a, a licensed mortgage professional that is uh, sponsored by this pr program and can offer that like we can. So we can guide you through that process as well, which by the way is coming out this month oh good point i love i love it yes talk to talk to talk to my man kyle right here give him a call <laughs> it's huge i mean it's like crazy how big like uh i've never i mean i haven't been into the game as long as you have but that's i mean the whole thing like 20 the whole 20 percent, like wow <laughs> But anyway, yeah, it definitely uh, solves let's, let's, for a number of things. Like if you don't have the down payment or closing costs, or you don't have sufficient amount of down payment and closing costs. And imagine um, if you were to receive that amount of support, how much lower your monthly payment could be. Um, so it helps to solve the affordability okay. issues as well as we were talking about earlier. Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. Um, let's get into the impacts of, of interest rates. How do you uh, fluctuating interest rates impact mortgage strategies for new buyers versus those looking just to refinance? refinance? Excuse me. Yeah, it's such a good question because interest rates have such a significant impact. And if we're talking also about misconceptions, uh, not just by first time home buyers, but buyers in general, 
a common misconception I get today is, um, you know, one sellers are desperate and they're not in most instances, they have, um, you know, tremendous equity and most of them don't have to sell. But the reason why I bring this up is, um, a common strategy that buyers think, um, has the greatest impact on, um, their future monthly payment is the price of the home and more specifically low balling right. sellers. What they don't quite understand right. is the interest rate can have a even greater impact on their monthly payment, which is to say more specifically, if you had the choice of low balling a seller or getting a lower interest rate, always, or maybe not always, but typically you would want to Majority. choose the lower <laughs> interest rate because in most instances, it will yield a lower monthly payment, which is why if we're going back to the strategies that lenders um, have implemented over the past few years, and it's still relevant in today's market is the buy down strategies. So whether it's, it's paid by a seller or a builder, um, again, I keep going back to affordability because that's the biggest challenge is using credits to buy down the interest rate is not only a great way to qualify, but also to get an affordable monthly payment because it's lowering the interest rate. So we go back to what the question is, like how big of an impact are mortgage rates? Um, they are almost the biggest impact. And this is one of the ways that you can offset interest rates through those credits and buy downs. And we see that today with builders offering unbelievable incentives and buy downs and a seller, um, you know, at the prospect of generating a lot more interest in their property or incentivizing more buyers to make an offer in exchange or in lieu of a price reduction, they may offer seller credits, which again, may, may be less of an impact on a seller and a greater impact on a buyer because yet again, it's lowering their monthly payments through offsetting their interest rate. Yeah, a smart buyer would be happy to see that instead of um, a little bit lower of a, of a you know, amount of the house is being sold for because like you're saying, in the long run, it's better for Yeah, of course. Them. And these, so. these are the things that, uh, why you should have a conversation in the first place. Like you would... Absolutely. If you're not consuming this content, you're not watching Kevin's podcast here, um, you, you're not doing the research or even more importantly, having conversations with mortgage professionals, you wouldn't even know this existed. So when I get the objection, which I've received multiple times today, uh, of people searching, browsing, quote unquote, online, but thinking that interest rates are too high, what they don't know is we just closed last week with a buyer in, in the fives. And had, had they known that, Ooh, they nice. would have, um, they may be more willing to move forward. And that's not an advertisement and that's not, um, you know, necessarily applicable to everyone. But I'm just saying, based on right. what you see um, in the marketplace t today, doesn't necessarily mean that applies to you. Good point. I love it. Can you explain the differences between the various loan types and programs available, such as FHA, VA, and conventional loans, and how you help clients choose the best one for their situation? Yeah, let's talk about loan programs. So as, as part of the consultation with clients that we go through, we discuss what loan programs are out there and what may be more uh, applicable to a particular client's situation. Now, you have your standard loan programs your conventional FHA, VA, USDA programs. This is the main bucket that most mortgage lenders and banks um, utilize. These are your most common home loan programs. Alternatively, there is um, other types of mortgage programs out there that may be applicable to clients' current situation. So those, those four that I just referenced are considered um, qualified mortgages, whereas there are non-qualified mortgage options as well. 
So we see a wow. growing number of clients that are, let's say, self-employed or may not have the traditional type of income needed to fall within the standard box, qualified mortgage box. So what lenders have done to get creative um, and not creative in the sense of what we saw 10 years ago when, when they were taking advantage of clients, that doesn't exist today. All the rules and protections are still in place, but there are some options, alternative loan options out there to assist again, um, like self-employed borrowers that may not fall in that box. So you've got your, you know, uh, bank statement loans, the debt service coverage ratio runs some more creative options out there. And then of course you always have your, um, private money. This would be if you were like an investor and you were looking to flip a house or um, to renovate a property, you have private investment, which tends to have their own rules. Um, but that, that sort of spans the spectrum of the types of loan programs that you would come across um, for home loans specifically. For the vast majority of clients, they will fall in the qualified mortgage buckets um, for a select number of clients in a growing population that is self-employed or has multiple jobs, um, and it may not fall within that bucket, that qualified mortgage option, we still have below programs for, for those prospective borrowers today. And so again, just would advocate having a conversation with the mortgage professional if you're in considering, uh, in consideration of purchasing so we can talk about what program applies to you. Definitely. Cause you don't want someone that's, you know, employed or someone that, you know, doesn't have like, uh, the W2 that are like 1099 comparing, you know, someone that has a loan or they're thinking about an FHA or, you know, something like that, it's that doesn't compete they, or doesn't compute. They gotta, they gotta talk to you guys. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's a different language. And that, that's what I say to my clients. I'm like, you know, what profession are you in? And they'll say engineering or they're doctors or they're in healthcare, uh, they're in construction. Um, and I go, I wouldn't have the first clue about how your industry works or, or the jargon that they use. And the same thing is for the mortgage industry. We're not trained in school how to buy a house, unfortunately. And so it's important to work with a professional that has your best interests in mind and is guiding you through what, what is a, uh, a relevant, um, and, and, um, you know, what interest rate is the market bearing currently and what interest rate would you potentially get as a prospective borrower, what loan programs are out there and which pertain to you prospective borrower, you know, these are the things that we're, uh, walking our clients through. I love it. That's awesome. So what about like, uh, for those concerned about their credit scores, what tips do you offer to improve their chances of se securing a favorable mortgage rate? Yeah. So I take that as a, a kind of a multiple part question. One is, you know, credit score. Two is interest rate. And yes, credit score mm -hmm. is one factor, but so is employment and more specifically income as well as assets. So these are the three main categories that lenders use to determine the risk level and, and thus the interest rate they're willing to give you based on the level of risk. So your credit score, your income relative to your debts, and your down payment relative to your purchase price. And I could say things like debt to income ratio and loan to value, but um, you know that, that may confuse some folks. We're just talking credit, income, and assets. And so all of those factor into what interest rate a bank would be willing to give you and thus your monthly payment. And so I, I would not steer people away from the, their infatuation with interest rates and what's my rate, what's my rate. That's important. But you also want to know what is the cost for that interest rate? Because I can certainly find you lenders that offer the lowest interest rate possible, but would you be willing to pay for the cost associated with that? Not in all instances. Um, 
the, and, and most importantly, what I would say is outside of interest rate, monthly payment is the most important in my opinion, because that's what ensures not only that you are comfortable with that, but it helps to ensure that you can make your future monthly payments. We're not in the business of just helping you buy a home. We're in the business of helping you keep a home and you have to have that perspective. The monthly payment is one of the most important factors. You got to see behind the interest rate and and just what is the lowest interest rate. Good point. Good point. So what about... um... Do you have strategies that you can recommend for managing down payments, you know, especially for those who might not have that traditional 20% to put down? Yeah, I think this is also one of the challenges is how in a, a marketplace where every cost is going up, gas, groceries, um, like I, I don't honestly know something that hasn't gone up in price significantly. Now, I know the government, and this is, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to have a political conversation here, is working to try to lower inflation and thus lower costs for goods, but with the assumption that it will become more expensive things, services will become more expensive in the future. How can you also simultaneously save while spending more? That's a big challenge. So you look at um, what it will take, like, what are the traditional ways people come up with a down payment in the first place? Well, now let's talk about something relevant. Let's talk about tax returns, right? Some people yeah. utilize okay. their tax returns and their tax refunds for their down payment and closing costs. That's something to consider and very timely um, in today's marketplace. But traditionally speaking, it's going to be your checking and savings, things that you've been saving for a while and possibly even like retirement um, or investment accounts. Um, but also, did you know you can utilize gift funds from family member and friends? Um, you know, so oh. there's, there's some ways that people, you know, not in all, these don't apply to everyone, but there are options out there for you to come up with uh, the down payment and closing costs, in addition to the programs like the Dream for All program, which can bridge the gap as well. Down payment assistance is um, a relevant option today because one of the ways to overcome affordability challenges and qualifying for a purchase is having the funds for the down payment and closing costs, and down payment assistance can help. Yeah, that down payment is huge. Um, what about the pre-approval process? I mean, how important is the pre-approval process in today's real estate market? And what steps should buyers take to ensure they're prepared? Well, ironically, we've been talking about the pre-approval process. We like literally have been yes. walking through it. Remember how we talked about an yeah. application reviewing credit income and assets? That is literally the pre-approval process. And the common misconceptions that that's going to hurt my credit or I have to make a commitment simply to put a plan in place and for you as a prospective buyer to know where you stand. So my advice is to get pre-approved sooner rather than later. And that's not necessarily self-serving because I do have clients that um, may be waiting six to 12 months, even after we've had our first conversation, or maybe even we've been pre-approved and they're just not satisfied with maybe the low inventory and the, the types of homes that are available. Well, the good thing is inventories is um, increasing and we've seen that most recently. Um, and two, by, by mm-hmm. getting pre-approved, by going through the process, you have the ability to pull the trigger if you do find the one. That's one of the biggest, yes, um, yeah. I think, advantages of starting the process early is oftentimes we hear from buyers like, no, 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 no I'm not going to have a conversation. I don't want to make any commitments until I find the house. And guess what? They almost always lose the house. They come to us after the fact and they try to rush the process and it can be overwhelming in those situations when you're competing with buyers that were fully committed from the onset or maybe had been searching for 12 months or maybe they have 20% to put down. How are you going to compete? against those buyers in a low inventory market, you have to be prepared. 
And so that's, uh, that's why I, I am a strong advocate, not of making a commitment, not of dinging your credit unnecessarily, but getting a pre-approval to know where you stand and to be able to pull the trigger if you do find that perfect house for your family. Yeah. The pre-approval, you know, as a real estate agent, if, uh, if a buyer comes to me and they're serious about buying, the first thing I'm asking is, are they pre-approved and how can we get you pre-approved? Like, you know, because there you have to, like you said, you have to be prepared because that, that only takes that one time where they, they think that's their dream home and then they're not prepared and it slips underneath them. And then, it, you know, they're, they're just crushed. So then you just kind of learn the hard way and then they go get pre-approved and then they're, you know, but let's, we're just kind of hoping that people can You don't have to that, learn the hard way. <laughs> yeah, learn exactly. from this podcast learn from our advice and and uh you know don't make that common mistake exactly 100 percent. so um what about some mortgage technology trends with technology evolving how is the mortgage application and approval process changing and what benefits does this bring to potential home buyers well i think it definitely speaks to the younger generations which are accustomed to technology, right? And, and just in general, Definitely. most generations today are just somewhat familiar with utilizing their mobile phones as an example. And this isn't new necessarily to the mortgage industry, but I definitely think that there's a higher level of um, either receptiveness or adoption to utilizing mobile applications and um, mobile devices for this process. And I think there's a lot more work our industries, not just mortgage, real estate, title, escrow can do to bridge the gap, to streamline the process even more. Um, but also while at the same time, keeping the customer experience at the forefront of it, it's one thing to do the, um, it's one thing to make it convenient right? To utilize um, mm -hmm. mobile technology as an example. But if it's not to the betterment of the consumer, if it's not perceived to be easier or faster, then I don't think, you know, utilizing technology for the sake of technology is, is really beneficial. Like we, I want to see a meaningful impact again, whether that be in convenience or speed, or by eliminating costs on the mortgage or real estate side and being able to pass those savings on to consumers, uh, that I'm a strong advocate of. So I, I do think just in general with younger generations um, being more accustomed to use it, utilizing technology and as they start to become, you know, um, represent a larger portion of home buyers in general, uh, but also with the speed and efficiencies and cost savings that I think uh, eventually technology can provide that uh, I'm, again, a strong advocate for and get really good feedback based on, you know, our offering and, cli and clients' um, experience um, as they go through their home buying and journey. Uh, are you seeing any... Uh um, advancements in AI on your end? Like, uh, I know it's kind of early, but like, it's just, you know, the word AI is yeah, kind of yeah. a um, buzzword, but I'm not trying to put that in there. I just, uh, just curious uh, your take on AI. Are you um, like all about it or are you just kind of like, it's just, uh, it's, it's kind of one of those bubbles going to burst and everybody's just talking yeah, well, about it. My uh, previous career before mortgages was in Silicon Valley. So technology oh, okay. uh, is something I'm very much accustomed to. And I'm generally an advocate of technology, but there's also a uh -huh. suspicion in me, like, be careful what you wish for, right? Are, are we prepared to... Um, eliminate jobs entirely by utilizing technology in a way um, where, you know, we, we live in a society that, that replaces the need for most jobs. I don't know if I'm an advocate, you know, I, I don't know if I would go that far, but I do think there's a way to supplement, um, you know, what a person can do. I think there's a way to make people more efficient 
and utilizing technology again as a supplement i'm an advocate for from 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 a mortgage industry perspective i think big corporations mm -hmm. big banks are testing ai they're trying to utilize it more from my experience on the decision making process like the qualifications analyzing documentation a lot of the busy work that we have on the back end that most consumers don't see like they're sort of frustrated that they have to provide all this information and and trust me as as a mortgage professional as a salesperson i don't like it as much as as the next person but i also have the perspective of yeah. you know banks are doing their due diligence they're lending hundreds of thousands of dollars but did you know there's annual, uh, a very manual process for analyzing that information still to this day oh. and so can can we use technology to help make quicker decisions and to supplement what would be you know really expensive jobs reviewing the same documentation over and over again i think there's a, a way to utilize that but from a consumer perspective i don't think companies have tried what what they found with like iBuyer programs and things that uh, mm -hmm. big companies that we all know that again will not be named have yeah. failed miserably on is yeah. it, up until this point completely removing the human from the process um to my knowledge has failed um and that's not to say that that will be the case forever but um i think it'll be a while before a person will uh, leave the biggest decision of their entire life, the most expensive decision ever to a computer with no human interaction whatsoever. I don't even think uh, people are ready for that yet. And from my experience, mm, so yeah. much call, calling, text messaging, email from us, just letting them know where are they at in the process and what's next, that it would be difficult to just let a computer do that I, I just don't even think um a consumer totally. would be open to that today based on my experience so it, i think I technology is here to stay um but i i'm not sure it's going to mm -hmm. be replacing uh lenders or real estate agents any time in the near future yeah i agree i love it like it's like um the type of person that it's it's still coming whether we like it or not so you might as well embrace it but i don't i don't look for it to uh, replace i i look at it as um you know kind of helping our lives as you know especially as a real estate agent you know it just kind of helps with like you know marketing and doing anything to, to free up time to focus on what matters the most and that's your clients and all that kind of stuff so that's the part that I'm looking That's what to I love, see how that right? If I didn't it. have to do the paperwork, yeah. if I didn't have to worry about those things yeah. and I could spend more time with my clients, um, you know, th there's a delicate balance today because we have to do both, but I certainly would be able mm -hmm. to um, work with clients more if I didn't have to do as much on the back end, the paperwork and, and things of that nature. So yeah, I'm a strong advocate for it. I just think we have to be mindful how it's utilized and also keep the perspective of, is this benefiting the consumer, the, the prospective home Good buyer? Point. Good point. That's really all that it matters in the end, especially in this industry. Um, so what about investment properties or second homes? Um, are clients interested in purchasing investment properties or second homes? What unique considerations should they keep in mind regarding mortgage planning? Probably more so than anyone and not, not because they're of lack of experience, right? By definition, they probably own a primary residence if they're buying an investment property or a second home. I do think that um, mortgage rates have an even greater impact, however, on these types of clients because it tends to be a little bit more expensive than buying a primary residence. So we saw an overwhelming amount of clients purchase second home and investment properties when rates were near all time lows. We, you, you know, you see here or you heard of those Airbnb success stories. I think it's less prevalent today because of the costs. Uh, yeah. You know, you have your really well-off clients that will just pay cash anyways, that still represent about 20 to 30% of the market. However, with 
well, seventy. Yeah, cash cash buyers represent about seventy, about uh, excuse me, twenty to thirty percent, depending on the market. That's high. Um, and it's the highest. It's sorry, I didn't no, mean great. You it's good good feedback. It's the highest it's been in a while because of uh, prices and mortgage rates. I think. Um, but if, if you are in consideration of, of a, let's say second home, um, there's some pretty unique rules around how far away it can be from your primary residence. How do you utilize that property? Can you offset it? Do the local jurisdictions allow you to have a short-term rental versus a long-term rental? Are you prepared to, um, be a landlord? You know, these are the kinds of conversations we're having with second time buyers. All right. So looking ahead, as we, you know, look towards the future, what, what changes or innovations within the mortgage industry do you believe will have the most significant impact on home buyers in the Sacramento area? Uh, so innovations, I think not just in the Sacramento region, because I serve many regions and uh, many states um, that I'm licensed in, but um, Sacramento provides a unique opportunity for you know, Bay Area families. We get a lot of requests for helping to solve the affordability crisis, if you will, by finding less expensive places to buy. And so there's been a huge migration over the past few years from the Bay Area to Sacramento because it's more affordable in many instances. and it can provide um, more flexibility for families um, looking for maybe a slightly different type of living while also being in proximity to the Bay Area. But if I'm, if I'm talking more broadly, not just California, West mm -hmm. Coast, but the other states that we're licensed in, I think something to be mindful of is everyone or many buyers, I should say, are waiting for mortgage rates to crash. And what we've learned from the mortgage industry is although we've been hopeful and have marketed lower interest rates for quite some time, they're not quite here yet. You know, so interest rates peaked about October of last year and, and they've been trending down, but that isn't to say that interest rates just go down or just go up. They follow um, much like the stock market or a roller coaster, they tend to go up and down. Um, and, and what you're looking for is the medium and long-term trends and the medium and long-term trends suggest that interest rates are going to come down, but we don't know how far and how fast. So my, my only advice yeah. is it, you know, not just from an innovation perspective is just be mindful of the historical significance of where rates are and, um, why we are in this position because inflation has been higher than average. And in order to remove demand and lower prices from the market, they've made it, they being um, the government controlling monetary policy, have made it more expensive. So until inflation truly is solved for, um, mm. it's likely mortgage rates are going to crash anytime soon. So the innovation is, is, is not um, an innovation, but it's more so having the perspective of if you are on the fence about buying, be prepared to compete with millions that are on the fence, right? We saw this during the past few years when rates hit all time low, look at all yes. of the competition that that created, all the offers over asking, it's likely a similar scenario will play out because of all the, 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 uh, built up demand that that this is mm. uh, this current market is creating. So I, I would caution people of waiting for mortgage mortgage rates to crash before having a conversation with a mortgage professional, and and that's a perfect segue and and uh, great way I think to culminate this conversation is you know knowing now what the process entails knowing some of the misconceptions about having to make commitments or having negative impacts on your credit by speaking with a real estate or mortgage professional. And as a mortgage professional, we get it. The real estate is the sexy part. I just want to see the house, of course. Yeah. Yeah. 
But yeah. why would you want to set yourself up for failure? Why would you want to fall in love with a house that you don't qualify for? You know, and so having the conversation, right. knowing that mortgage rates are not likely to crash anytime in the near future and being prepared in the event that you come across the one, we find clients that take those steps, um, have a much better experience and, and have a greater chance of getting that perfect house that they want the first time around. And so that's what our innovation uh, or recommendation would be is, is not innovators at all, is the tried and true steps of getting pre-approved um, and knowing where you stand today is and will continue to be our recommendation. And for those of you that are the ones that like to do that stuff on their own, like um, put it in perspective of like, it, it, I mean, because I have been lucky enough to purchase my own home and, and it's nice to know, like, um, this is what they do best. This is what Kyle does best. Kyle is very good at this. And so to be able to just unload all that and let them do their part and he just does all that work and you know uh, behind the scenes and just knowing you got you're prepared you, you know you got kyle on your side then you can just look for like you all you want to do is go look for that house well then you then you have that confidence that peace of mind that you're ready and you're not gonna you know that perfect house isn't gonna pass you by because right. you weren't prepared i like how you said peace of mind so uh Kyle, did, did I miss anything? Is there anything else that you want to no, talk about? No, I think, um, you know, I just appreciate you being, uh, allowing us to be on the show and, and, you know, continue to be an advocate for buyers and sellers out there. I think there are some challenges, but, you know, because of um, agents like you, you know, sharing these best practices, I think consumers are being more educated. Um, now more than ever, there's so much content and, and education out there and we're a big advocate of that. So thank you again for uh, doing um, this and allowing us to be a part of it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on. And I, I, you know, like I said, I just I look forward to being able to um, meet you in person and, and actually have that lunch. Likewise. Thanks, Kyle. You have a wonderful rest of your day. 